Welcome everyone to another episode of the Truth Bright Real Estate Investing Show. I know most people are talking about the, <laughs> I'll get to it in a minute, everyone's talking about the slap at the Oscars, but even before we get to that, uh, I've been following the story for quite some time. I, I know some people that have been are personally infected by the uh, collapse of uh, the real estate company called Epic Alliance. I'll actually do a solo episode after this one. Uh, so uh, after this episode, I'll, I'll release a, a separate podcast specific to my thoughts around Epic Alliance's, uh, not my words, Epic Fail. Those are the words of Saskatoon Mayor. Um, but yeah, I'll do a separate podcast just about uh, learning lessons and my past experience of seeing uh, major collapses of real estate companies and how one may avoid such problems going forward. But yeah, <laughs> Sunday night, I, I, I saw the headlines about the uh, the Chris Rock uh, slap as well, like, like everyone else did. I thought it was just clickbait, you know, I thought it was all fake, just a, uh, a gag, not fake, but I thought it was a joke. And then I saw the uh, unedited footage and holy cow. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, as usual, I any sort of in, in, any information I take in, I always look for what are, what are the learning lessons? What do I teach my kids about it? So uh, I go over self-defense with my kids and I teach them, show them, should anyone approach you aggressively, control the distance, get your hands up, use the words no and stop get out of there if you can and remember your training the important thing is that you're trained for these situations uh, my kids are going through extensive training for for good reason so i can sleep well at night <laughs> all you fathers of daughters out there know exactly what i'm talking about uh, i can't predict uh but i'm guessing will smith might have had thought twice about crossing uh about slapping chris rock if chris had a black belt or two under his belt <laughs> black belt martial arts that is that's not an excuse for Chris's joke directed at Jada Smith, uh, but hitting someone is just inexcusable, especially in such a public uh, forum. Uh, Self-defense talk on a real estate show, eh? Yeah, I'm sure I'm probably going to lose some listeners. <laughs> and I hope you 17 committed listeners uh, allow me some leeway, uh, as there is usually some method to my persistent madness, as I have a point. A friend of the show, friend of the show, Emma Kelly, uh, has been a well-renowned uh, real estate investor and coach, Elizabeth Kelly. Uh, she shared on the show around Christmas time, was it, uh, that her husband was assaulted by multiple tenants. I believe the number was three in their own property management office. Uh, he, it was pretty serious. Um, after, and the dispute was over something minor, uh, simply monetary damages to be paid for damages to the prop to the property that these tenants had made. Um, and as always, I'm not here to scare anyone. Uh, the show is about the truth. So I'm not pulling any punches. These are the truths about real estate investing. Um, not everyone's reasonable in how they behave. And uh, to you know, learn from these lessons and so that not so that these challenges are never repeated. Uh, my general outlook, as always, is caution. That's both uh, in life and in investing. Uh, I generally believe that people are doing the best with the resources they have. Uh, Sometimes those resources aren't the best and they behave accordingly. Uh, and for myself and my family to always be prepared for whatever is happening. Uh, as, a, as for example, right now, I'm preparing for what could be a recession. If war escalates in Ukraine, if, uh, inter if uh, inflation continues out of control. Um, but I, I am optimistic, cautiously optimistic, as um, I'm hoping we can return to regular inflation, <laughs> the regular inflation of central banks printing money uh, and my real estate and stocks go up slowly as planned. Uh, I honestly think that the, uh, that the war in Ukraine should hopefully uh, go to peace, hopefully soon, uh, as both parties, um, the British have stalemates. Uh, Russia is not doing that well in the war. Ukraine has done the, honestly an incredible job of um, holding their ground and uh, they're not getting. They're not going to receive any significant outside help. So, I think both parties know where they're at. So, hopefully, we can have peace. Uh, on a personal note, Terry and I have postponed our trip to Disney in May and replaced it with our uh, family trip to our favorite city in Canada, 
No, it's not Edmonton. It's not Hamilton either. <laughs> the beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, with all the COVID measures in place for travel and at Disney specifically, it, it didn't feel like this. It didn't seem like the best time for a, a massively expensive trip. I'm not even. I'm pretty much sure you cannot hug Mickey Mouse. So why would we drop? all this money for the most magical place on the earth. <laughs> so we're going to hit, you know, Vancouver, do the touristy thing, Capilano suspension bridge. I'm going to eat a bunch of wild salmon sushi. I don't know what the kids are going to do. That's okay though. <laughs> I'll save money. They can have chicken teriyaki, whatever. And Cherry and I are arguing who's going to take the stairs at the, for the grouse grind. So Cherry is actually next door. So I can't speak too, too loudly. I don't want to do the stairs. So I pretend I do want to do the stairs and Cherry can take the gondola up with the right, take the gondola right up with the kids. That's what I told her. So she immediately said, no, I'm going to take the stairs and you take the right gondola up with the kids. And just think of all the money I'll save. I'll probably save at least 20 bucks by Cherry taking the stairs and not spending it on the gondola. Fun useless fact of the day. Oh, and we're going to be there late May. Uh, so if anyone else has suggestions on things we should be doing, uh, we are all ears. As you know, we are pretty open minded folks. On to this week's guest, uh, this the path to success is not a straight line. I hope no one ever thinks it is. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've had plenty of guests on this show to explain it's not. And this week's guest is no different in, Cor uh, in Corey Spurley. And he, he's got a per he's the perfect example of having started a career. Uh, he worked in the oil sands. Uh, he invested in Alberta in pursuit of cash flow instead of being close to home in Kelowna, BC. So for those of you who've been around, know the economic challenges of Alberta. And hopefully you know how well Kelowna, BC has done. Uh, and Corey invested in Alberta all the way riding up the peak, including buying at the peak, and then the eventual collapse of the oil market and the real estate prices with it. Uh, of course, things are rebounding. Oil is cyclical. I couldn't deal with that kind of drama. <laughs> cyclical real estate market like they do. Uh, we talk about the differences in investing between Saskatoon and Edmonton. Uh, Corey's experience investing in, uh, he's, he's invested in 10 apartment buildings, uh, six of which are with other investors, with having other investors put up the capital. Corey is kind enough to share his truths about real estate investing, including having to work for free because he bought real estate uh, at the peak and things didn't go as planned. He even had to come out of pocket uh, during those down years uh, uh, in the Edmonton market. I'm sure the Saskatoon market as well. Uh, Corey is the multifamily educator uh, with uh, his six pillars of multifamily success program. And he's even getting into event planning. Uh, he hosted a, a virtual uh, conference called the Real Estate Outlook 2022 and beyond. That was back in March. Uh, we'll, and we go into detail how he structures joint ventures near the end of this show and the, near the end of the interview and the lessons doing so. So you really don't want to miss it, especially with all the uh, turmoil going on with uh, other investors, unfortunately, doing things the wrong way. Please enjoy the show. Hi, uh, Kari. What's what's keeping you busy these days? And and thanks for coming on. I know you're a busy guy. You got a lot of things going on. But yeah, what what is keeping you busy these days? Well, thanks, Erwin. You know, it's uh, living in Kelowna right now. It's spring break, so you know, between juggling kids and business, um, I'm still working on multifamily. I, I manage a, you know, I manage six apartment buildings right now. You know, with partners, and I'm also I'm inv actively involved in uh, doing a real estate summit. It's my first summit I've ever put together. So we're, you know, we're getting professionals from across the country to get their opinion on, you know, the real estate outlook for 2022 and beyond. So that's been a busy project, but you know, it's, it's going very well. Yeah. That's fantastic. You, you weren't busy enough. So you, <laughs> <a> conference. <laughs> you know, I, I decided to hire, I hired a coach to help me out when I was, you know, I was starting to get into education and coaching. So then, uh -huh. oh, let's just do a summit and do a webinar. I didn't know what a summit or how to do a webinar. It's like, yeah, no big deal. Piece of cake. You know, but then once I got into it and realized how much work it was, but yeah. you know, it's been, it's been fabulous and rewarding, but it has been a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Cause uh, again, like your time must be valuable. I'm sure it's very expensive. I'm sure you pay a lot of money to save your time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. You're going out, out of your way to get the word out. Yeah. Hmm, fantastic. Uh, and before we started recording, we were, we were going over the, the history of your name. 
Spurly. Yeah. Spurly. Yeah. All right. And can you, can you share um, the heritage of that name? Yeah. So I, I just talked to my, my 97 year old grandfather, you know, in Saskatchewan, you know, most of the Spurleys, they immigrated to Regina, Saskatchewan. And I just learned that both of my grandparents, you know, actually came from Odessa, you know, around 1910. So they were fleeing the, the first world war. So, you know, after I learned that, I realized my, you know, my grandfather who speaks German and not Ukrainian. So I, I always thought, I always just assumed I had German heritage and yeah, to learn. So he's, he's really following it. And, you know, at the 97 year old, he's still, you know, very much retains every memory he has, you know, of childhood. So I found that very interesting and it was very personal to hear that. Right. Crazy. Yeah. If, if he didn't flee, he might not be alive. <laughs> no, definitely be in a sticky situation right now. Yeah. <laughs> How grateful is he to be Canadian? <laughs> Yeah, very. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, man. All right. And uh, so you live in Kelowna, BC? Correct. Yeah. And it's a pretty nice place, I understand. Yeah, we, um, I moved from Edmonton back in 2014. You know, the, the real estate market was the opposite. It was booming in Edmonton and it was dead in Kelowna. So Ooh. it was a, an economically cheaper move to move here. It's the complete opposite now. But yeah, I mean, it's a vacation destination. It's a retiree destination. I think it's in the last two years since the last census, it's probably one of the fastest growing cities in the, in the country. So it's a little bit nutty, but yeah, it's a beautiful place for sure. Okay. So we, we've talked on the show quite a bit about Alberta. Um, yeah. what, what caused the boom for Kelowna? You know, I think right uh, the last couple of years, I think it's just been, there's been a lot of Albertans moving out here. You know, a lot of people were doing shift work. And since the pandemic, every, like there's a lot of work from home. So a lot of people are moving from like all across the country because, well, if I'm going to set up shop, I might as well be in Kelowna. That and people in the lower mainland, you know, cashing out, you know, they have one, two and a half million dollar houses, you know, that are falling apart so they can easily cash out, throw a million bucks in the bank and buy something here. So that's, you know, further fuel the market. So at least that's kind of the opinion of the local real estate agents when I talk to them. Right. And so... It uh, is it crazy in Kelowna? Like prices, are they up like 30%? Like Oh yeah, it's Kelowna nuts. Like, Detroit? yeah, it's nuts. It's multiple bidding wars on everything. Probably not, not uncommon to the market that you're in right now. Erwin. Yeah, it, we're seeing, we're, uh, we're, we're doing this on March uh, 11th, but yeah, we're, we're starting to see some slowdown. Oh, that's but yeah, good. just, just before <laughs> it though, you know, eight to 30 offers was normal. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a horror story for, I just feel badly for these, you know, people trying to get in right now. It's part of the reason why I'm doing this summit. Cause you know, a lot of people have just lost hope of ever, of ever owning a house, you know, especially like first time buyers or millennials, man, like, how do I even do this? So that was part of the motivation to, to do the summit. Uh, in the areas that you focus on, do you see the same challenges? So for example, in Ontario and Toronto, we have, you know, I, I, they must be just look, it must be a local phenomenon. We have this thing called NIMBYs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a local species. I don't know if they propagated themselves <laughs> to your areas. Do you have, do you have the similar issues where locals are um, obst basically obstructing uh, new developments? Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely in Kelowna. It's, there's very, very territorial. There's a lot of communities you know, they're, you know, resisting development. I mean, the mayor of Kelowna, Colin Bazard, he's decided to, you know, take the densification route versus, you know, urban sprawl in Calgary, where they just, you know, chop up huge swaths of land, you know, which is a good idea, but it obviously has huge impacts on, you know, local traffic patterns and stuff. And, you know, when you can't please everybody, you know, when you're trying to, trying to grow a city, but I mean, in the markets that I invest in for my real estate holdings, Alberta and Saskatchewan, not so much, you know, they're a lot more, you know, I guess, welcoming of development, you know, mm -hmm. from my experience. Mm -hmm. So why the decision to invest uh, away from home? Yeah. So when I, when I moved here, I had most of my, well, all of my real estate holdings, you know, we're in Alberta and Saskatchewan. I own some single family and multifamily apartments. And it was mostly because of the economics. I mean, incomes were higher and housing costs lower than they were in British Columbia. And you know, plus BC has rent control laws, which makes it difficult, more difficult to be a landlord, you know, get your rents up, you know, et cetera. And, you know, since I moved here, when I moved here, the market here was low in 2014. Housing was significantly cheaper than Edmonton. And today it's more than double Edmonton. <laughs> so, you know, in that, in that eight years that I've been here, 
you know, it's done a complete reversal. You know, the Edmonton market's been either flat or declining. You know, it's just kind of, it's going back up now the last year, especially in Calgary. But, you know, the last seven years prior, it's just been flatter going down. And, you know, Kelowna, Victoria, Vancouver has just been going straight up. Mm-hmm. So I've kind of been sitting here watching, you know, wondering, well, should I, should I invest in Kelowna? But it's more of a speculative nature. I mean, I always invest on fundamentals and cash flow and actual, uh, you know, more, more along those lines than getting, getting into speculation. Okay, so again, it's March 11th, 2022. <laughs> what kind of investments are you looking for now? Are you adding, are you divesting? So a little both. Steady? Great. Yeah, sorry, what was the last one? Or holding steady? Yeah, so, you know, short answer, all of the above. I mean, we just sold an 11-unit apartment building, in, or sorry, 12-unit in Saskatoon in November. And it's simply because, you know, the holdings I have, I bought with joint, in joint venture agreements. You know, we had predetermined exit points you know, when we'd hit, you know, either five years or so much percent return on investment. So yeah, we pulled the trigger on the sale. I'm wishing we hadn't have sold that one now because, you know, right now there's a, there's a lot of interest in multifamily, especially on the prairies. We're seeing a lot of interest coming from, you know, places like Ontario, the Maritimes, NBC, you know, and even Alberta. So um, we, I have two more buildings, three more buildings that I'm planning to sell. So I'm, I've compiled a buyer's list. You know, a lot of people have contacted me wanting information. So I'm putting packages together. But I'm kind of like, I want to go back to my investors and say, you know, guys, this is starting to look like 2007. You know, we, maybe we should hold for another year because we're st- seeing a massive increase in prices and rents because vacancies are coming down for the first time in like six years to a point where we can raise rents. I mean, I haven't raised rent on, a, on an Edmonton unit in over seven years. So for some people, that's unheard of. You know, we're given like month, two month incentives just to fill units. So yeah, so selling on that point um, because you know we're at the joint joint venture end, holding some because I have a couple of really good assets that our partners are just dead set against selling. So we're just going to hold those, and then you know with my partner and I, you know Mike Bug, we just bought another. We just purchased the seven a seventeen unit building in Leduc, Alberta, which is Edmonton, essentially by the airport in November, and I've been writing offers probably two offers a week ever since, looking for more projects. And, you know, I'm hoping to pick up two or three apartment buildings this year for sure. And how active is it? How many, how many offers are, are you up against or, or if any? I, I try not to compete. So my strategy is kind of unique. Uh, I, I don't get into bidding wars. You know, a great example of that is there was someone asked me on my, I did a webinar last week on the seven tips of multifamily. And somebody asked me about judicial listings. You know, what about foreclosures? I said, forget it because... It's, it's public. Everyone knows about it. It turned into a bidding war and an unconditional offer of way more than I would ever pay. So, you know, I, I go back to stale MLS listings. People stay off MLS. You know, I, I look for motivated sellers. Eventually, they overprice their properties. You know, three months, six months, they might have two, three, four offers fall apart because they can't get financing. And then I put in an offer what I think is fair. And, you know, on at least four apartment buildings, you know, two, three, six months later, they come back to me you know, at the price I offered. So I have more, a way, a much more of a patient strategy and systematic strategy. And, and it's worked well for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then what about your experience when you sold your 11 unit building? Was there much interest? Yeah. You know, that was, that was kind of towards the end of 2021. You know, when I started marketing it, I started marketing it early in the year because I wanted to give potential buyers a chance to qualify for CMHC because I know the, you know, the terms of CMHC are, were outstanding at the time. I mean, from a period from uh, basically from March of 2021 to or March of 20, when pandemic started to February of 21, you could have got a, you know interest rate on a multifamily at like less than one and a half percent. So that's when people owners were refinancing their buildings like crazy, pulling out equity, redeploying it. So that was the time I was, I was marketing that property. But I think that maybe just Saskatchewan just wasn't on the radar yet. Uh, I wasn't able to generate, you know, the amount of interest I was hoping to. I hired a local realtor. I still did okay. I mean, we bought the building 100000 a unit in 2016. We sold it for 123000 So, you know, it was a decent lift in five years. So it was a decent return, return on investment for sure. But, um, you know, you always hear people, I wish I hadn't have sold that building. You don't usually hear them say, I wish I hadn't bought that building. You know what I mean? (laughs) 
Uh, well, you, you mentioned there were tough times, right? You mentioned earlier, like there was years that you couldn't raise rent. Uh, can For the listener who doesn't know, actually, you know, I'm sure many people don't know, what, what caused the, uh, the economic hardship? Yeah, and this is a story I love to share um, because I've been through cycles. You know, I was pretty bloody, I'll say I was arrogant and cocky when I got into multifamily. I was in Alberta 2004 to 2010 where you couldn't go wrong. You know, everything you bought was going up. The Alberta market was going up. I bought my first building in 2008. And then I changed niches. I moved to Saskatoon in 2016 because, you know, the rents had gone down a little bit from the oil, you know, crash. But I thought, ah, oh, no problem. You know, but I didn't realize they had overbuilt like crazy in the city. Vacancy rate in Saskatoon went from 5% to 20%. Oh my. So this is exactly what happened. And it, I almost went, I almost went bankrupt and I, I was going back to my investors and I had to eat crow like crazy. And I learned so much from this. I blew through my entire reserve fund because look, picture this. So there's a new build, you know, kind of in a neighborhood close to me. They had underground parking, in-suite laundry. They were renting for like 2000 when the vacancy hit, all of a sudden they dropped their rent to a thousand dollars. I was renting units for 1200. All of a sudden, all my tenants left to go to these really much nicer units. And I had to spend 10,000 fixing my suite and re-rent it for 800. And that went on for two years. So I basically turned over every single unit and I was doing this for three buildings and working a full-time job. So every money, all the money I was making at my job was going into subsidizing these buildings, praying for things to turn around and swearing to myself, I would never make, you know, honestly, looking back, no matter how much I planned, I couldn't have planned for that kind of event. I mean, potash, oil uranium you know the job market all caved all at the same time right which are all things and, that are in demand right now <laughs> yeah so i mean it's swinging the other way so the benefit is i i survived through that and uh now i have a newly renovated building that's performing well so many of my peers i know a lot of guys that went into edmonton 2014 their mortgages came up in 2019 with negative equity so the bank said okay you got to give us 300 grand to pay the loan down or sell at a loss. So there are owners that are still doing that. So people that took second mortgages are over leveraged, you know? So I, what I thought was an extremely conservative strategy at the time, you know, it barely got me past. So, you know, since then I'm always, you know, return, return of investment versus return on investment, you know? So I, that was a very humbling experience, but I'm glad, I'm glad it happened. And that was just one of many in the past 22 years of, uh, of my career. So it's one I like to share for sure. I'm sure some are feeling the same thing in like the stock and the crypto world. Like if they, like, you know, I think, I think the greatest lessons are learned from losses, not from, from not from winning. <laughs> and it's interesting you bring up crypto because I have a lot of friends that just swear by that and they're into that. And, and these are really sharp people, but honestly, Erwin, I just, I just don't understand it. I mean, I, I don't invest in something I don't understand. I understand that governments are corrupt and they're all trying to take over and all these other things. And I'm not you know, necessarily denying that that's true, but I mean, multifamily real estate is always in demand. I think it's inflation proof for the most part, you know, cause you know, as we see if, if rates go up really high and housing becomes more expensive, more and more of those got more of those um, owners will, will turn to renters. So it kind of balances out and yeah. as long as I think you buy at a decent price and have a healthy reserve fund. You know, I think it's an investment that'll keep chugging along. Yeah, you've got real estate. <laughs> yeah. if, if you got real estate, you're 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 not your your uh, your investments are, are similarly aligned with like Bitcoin. So it's you're you'll be I'm sure you'll be okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but yeah, because uh, in in our yeah same thing with, with the rest of the investor community out here many people are i'm actually surprised the participation rate into cryptocurrency specifically bitcoin um in, among the real estate investors because real estate investors are historically i want to be able to see and touch it right so i always make the joke like oh you're gonna pay me the bitcoin you're gonna whip out your wallet and pay me with bitcoins <laughs> <laughs> well your your market your multifamily market out there i did a podcast you know last week with the peak multifamily guys and uh you know the, the prices per door and the cap rates out there that they were telling me about and it's like it's it's almost like a we wish we would have paid you know six months ago because now it's even crazier even yeah. though that number didn't make any economic sense six months ago yeah. from a from a you know just a simple return 
you know, perspective. So it's completely different. And, and it's good that you bring it up because like back in 2017, when we had our little housing correction here, uh, financing became a problem for, for people, uh, for home buyers, right? A lot yeah. of people were, were, had jobs in industries that were affected by the pain. Um, actually, no, a couple of things. Sorry, let me just go back to actually 2020. That's what I was trying to refer to. Because mm-hmm. uh, you saw it, right? There, there was no effect on uh, be, ability to finance a multifamily in the spring of 2020 versus, you know, we were, you know, it's so people always say like, oh, it's so easy for real estate agents. Back in the spring of 2020, we'd have to sell a house several times. I remember one house, we had to sell it four times because twice it fell through on financing because the buyers had their jobs had exposure to, uh, you know, like airline or airline industries or hospitality. But yeah, your income was directly multi, right? affected. No, no, not to the extent. The only thing that happened with Maltese was the rent freeze. So we had government jurisdictions. We had a lot of politicians saying things they shouldn't have, like don't pay your rent, you know, and <laughs> things like this, you know, and there's rent freezes, you know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And, uh, Doug Ford said. I yeah, and the day he said it to you. <laughs> yeah, rent freeze. So suddenly you say you can't evict your tenants, then they what did they do? They stopped paying rent. But it's interesting you mentioned the the housing because I I coincidentally just sold my house in Cologne in March because CMHC at the time was saying it's gonna drop 10, 20 percent, you know. So I was like panicked and I had a house here and I sold it. And I ended up getting what I wanted, but there was very there was almost nothing else for sale, but nobody was buying. And Immediately after that, that's when it started to go gangbusters. So it did the exact opposite of what CMHC predicted. But I imagine for a realtor at the time, if you had offers and you know pending deals, and all of a sudden people's incomes were affected because businesses were shuttered, yeah, yeah that would throw wreak of wreak havoc. It was on tricky because the yeah. same house that's, that we had to sell four times they had really young kids. Yikes! Yeah, yeah, the sellers I think probably had a pet too. So like. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I know it looks easy on the outside. <laughs> not no, no, not at all. So, not sorry, Corey, all. you said you sold a house in Kelowna. Was it your home or was that was that investment property? Primary residence. Oh, man, you sold your home. Yeah. So you were homeless? <laughs> no, I, well, almost. I'm actually, I've been, I've been renting ever since, uh-huh. waiting to buy something else. It was a downsized move. But now I've, I'm kind of, you know, in that position where I'm kind of, I wouldn't say that I'm stuck because... I feel that markets are going to correct. You know, when I see what's happening here, it's very much like it was in, in Edmonton in 2007. I don't know if you had the same boom out there in 2007, everything went nuts and you know, it eventually works itself, works itself out. But I mean, timing wise, it, it was a house I didn't really want anyways. It was a money pit. You know, some people think, Oh, I'm just going to get a house cause it's it keeps going up in value, but I don't think it's an asset. I think it's a liability. I think it sucks money from you. And if you have a make workhouse, it sucks a lot of money from you. So, you know, it was, I don't regret the move, but well, I sure as hell wish I would have held it for a couple more years. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned problems that millennials and first time buyers and immigrants are facing. What are these problems? <laughs> well, kind of from the outside looking in, I mean, I'm essentially in the same boat now because I also don't own it's, um, a matter of qualification, you know, I've talked to some people about different strategies like rent to own, for example, which I don't, I'm not too familiar with that strategy, but I think you need, you need the qualifying income. So if someone's just coming to Canada, I think they need two years or it's either two years or four years to yeah, prove. Usually about two years of income for, for credit purposes. Yeah. Yeah. That, and they've added the you know, stress tests, all these other things, you know, a lot of millennials, they, they have the bank of mom and dad to help them out. You know, I found, I talked to a few of my neighbors and they just decided to give their inheritances to their kids now and say, here's the down payment for your house. And I think it's kind of, you know, effects on that. It, it affects, you know, keeps the housing market going up, but it's a way for them to get in. But I mean, even, even millennials now are starting young families. I'm even looking at like my daughter who's 18 she's in college, you know, how the heck is she ever going to, I mean, own something. I mean, should I be buying a condo now renting it out? So things I didn't really think about, you know, Talking to talking to Mike Bug last week, he's selling one of his properties in Saskatoon. His first r- rental property they bought ten years ago, and I think it's maybe gone up ten percent in value in ten years, which is kind of normal for how I've seen real estate appreciate. Like I haven't seen jumps like this that go thirty percent. So I know I understand from the buyer's perspective. I think the biggest thing they're faced with is fear of missing out. You know, if oh, I don't get boy. in right now. Yeah. Oh man, next year it's going to be even more. 
but you got to just, you got to get around that. Right. And you got to buy for what makes sense. I mean, you don't want to buy a $800,000 townhouse in Kelowna that was 500,000 last year. And when you tell people this thing could drop in value, they just look at you like you're from outer space. You're crazy. Yeah. No, no, it can never drop. What are you talking about? Haven't you been around the last six months? You know, it'll never drop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but you actually said it though already in your, in your sharing. You saw FOMO buying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was it 2014 in Alberta? And uh, yeah, that was probably like the ultimate FOMO buying, like peak FOMO buying-ish. <laughs> yeah, well, we, I sold, we sold the house in Edmonton 2014. It was 10 offers, very similar to what you're seeing in Kelowna here. And 2007, I remember watching people bidding on, I mean, I'll just take multifamily. There was a condo conversion craze also. But multifamily buildings went from 60,000 a unit in 2006 to 140,000 a unit within a year. And it was just nuts because they were stratifying them and selling them off to investors. Now, that's proven to be the worst investment in the history of real estate, those individual <laughs> condos in those old, old walk-ups. Um, what did but they pay at the them? time, it, sorry? What did, what, did the, what did the investors pay for the condos? Do you remember? Well, yeah, they were paying like around 100. Well, if, if the buildings were selling for 140, they were paying 160 to 180. <laughs> And now those, those condos aren't even worth 60. So there's companies that are actually reconverting these apartments. They're buying up all the units from the owners and flipping them back to buildings, which is the complete reverse you know, of what was happening before. So funny things happen when you get in these frenzies. You know? So don't get uh, swept up in FOMO for sure. So what would you tell, what would you tell a, a first-time buyer today then? How do yeah, I'd say just, FOMO? yeah, I'd say just be patient. You know, and I'd say there's, there's nothing undignified about renting. You know, I think a lot of us in Canada, we're just so spoiled to think that we have to own, if we don't own something, we don't, if we don't own a house, it's somehow it's beneath us or something like that. And, you know, I understand being in markets like Kelowna, if I suddenly had to leave this rental, I'm, rents have gone up here 40%. So it's, I understand the, the anxiety for renters as well. But I mean, I go to markets like Edmonton, I could rent a two bedroom apartment, all utilities for $900 with, you know, income significantly higher than they are in BC. So for a lot of like, you know, new immigrants, people coming to Canada, they flock to the prairies because they can set up businesses, they can make a lot of money and it's really cheap to live, whether they're buying or renting, right? Is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing a lot of immigrants coming into uh, the prairies? So my property manager in Saskatoon, uh, Shanda, she says, you know, we have a lot in our building. The one we just sold, actually, we had a, I think they were, I think they were maybe from Syria, but it was, they had their own community. So they actually had a waiting list for this building. <clears throat> it was fabulous. <clears throat> and Saskatoon has always been, excuse me, <clears throat> it's been always a, a place where, where, it, where like new immigrants come. Um, it's got the university there. You know, they'll tend to land in Quebec, but then they'll make their way to the prairies. And especially like in, in Alberta and Edmonton and places like this. Um, I think just the taxes are maybe lower, the business, you know, the business climate's more friendly. But, you know, talking to Shanda, the past two years, obviously that's slowed down because, uh, you know, of the pandemic and, you know, people haven't been able to come. But she's saying in the last couple of months, that's really been picking up. So you know, I anticipate massive growth on the prairies, especially like in the city of Saskatoon. And a large part of that is, is from immigration for sure. Good to hear. Yeah. This whole, this whole great resignation thing. <laughs> There's a million vac job vacancies in Canada and going up. Right. So for anyone who doesn't think we need the immigrants. <laughs> is it job vacancies? Is it just people that don't want to work? Or are they still on pandemic relief? Or know. is it employers aren't paying enough? <laughs> it's a combination of all of the above. Yeah. I don't know how many people are sitting this out. Mm. Like, I don't know anyone personally sitting out the job market. So, like, um, I don't know. You have any tenants sitting out the job market? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there's talk about it. I, I hear of like friends of friends that do it, but I don't know anyone personally who's sitting this out because of whatever. So, but yeah. Point is, though, we we have vacancy. We need we need someone who's willing to work. Oh, we sure do. <laughs> and to pay for yeah. these people that don't want to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, even Alberta that was, they've had their job market gutted with the oil industry, you know, in the past like six, seven years. Uh -huh. Now all of a sudden they're screaming for work. A lot of these projects are coming back on again. That's why you're, we're seeing a lot of our, our investors and a lot of people are buying in Edmonton, Fort Saskatchewan and these places now, because 
I mean, also because oil prices are so high. Um, it's interesting because <laughs> the Canadian dollar used to always be pegged to oil. You know, it used to mm -hmm. go up when, when there was an oil boom, but that's not happening now. And I think it's a lot of the reason is because a lot of the capital has fled to the States. You know, our, the loonie's not pegged to oil anymore because so, oil has gone gangbusters and our, you know, our loonie stayed the same, which is right, right. kind of added to the inflation problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that's not the next thing that the government has to try to deal with. But yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Cheaper. There's huge shortages in jobs. Hmm? It'll make our oil cheaper if our dollar's low. But yeah. yeah. This is with, with the war going on, flight to safety. Yeah. Uh, it's it's funny to say that people that the US dollar is a flight to safety. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I couldn't imagine what it's like to <laughs> can't imagine the calls that financial advisors are getting right now from their clients with the situation going on. It, Stress. Yeah, must be Should nuts. Be US dollars? What's this yeah. Bitcoin stuff? <laughs> gold, gold. <laughs> yeah, for, <laughs> financial advice is not going to be telling people to get buying gold. Actually, they probably will. <laughs> but like, you know, if I'm buying gold, I buy physical, right? Yeah, no, get an EFT where I can make some fees off of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crazy world out there. Yeah. Uh, and then, so what about investment wise? Um, for like a for like a first time home buyer immigrant, sit. Um, here's an example. I have, I have family. I have a family member who did rent because they live in Toronto, where it's crazy expensive. But they want yeah. an investment property, uh, uh, so someone else is paying rent for that. Um, that's not that's not accessible to everyone. What, what would you say to like the newer investor, like someone who says who say has like a hundred grand to invest? Well, I mean, I would just I would say the best thing is how I got started, and I house hacked. You know, I bought a, <laughs> I lived in the upstairs and I rented the basement. Get as many units as you can. I mean, if you, if you have a hundred grand, if you can qualify for CMHC 5% down, get a duplex or a fourplex, rent out the units and live in the other ones. That's the best way to get started, mm -hmm. you know, or, or use that to move in. And then after a year, I know the government's kind of maybe changing the rules, but you can live in a place for a year, move to somewhere else and keep that as a rental and, you know, move every couple of years if you don't mind doing that. But, um, Definitely house hack if you can. I know there's like generational housing now too, where, you know, people's parents are moving in my neighbor here, their parents just moved in with them. So, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that as well, but yeah, for someone just coming in and don't rush to just buy something, buy something that you're going to want to stick around. You know, I, I, I bought houses before and it's like, well, I just bought this because it was a hot market. I didn't actually really want this place, you know, so be sure what you're buying. I mean, townhouses are a good start because they're low maintenance. You know, you don't have a yard to look after thing, you know, things like that. And the strata fees are generally lower, but you know, condos, I've heard a lot of horror stories about special assessments. You don't want to buy a condo, then get, you know, whacked with a $50,000 expense. You know, I've heard a lot of stories like that. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen with every condo, but um, definitely like I would buy a single family home that has a suite. If I was coming to Canada right now, and not necessarily in the major centers, like we're at Toronto, maybe go someplace a little further out, like Kingston or something. Maybe it's a little cheaper. You know, that's definitely what I would do. hundred percent. Amazing. It's funny because house hacking at the term only came up. I only learned about the term maybe two years ago ish. And then not many people talk about it. Not before, but not before social media and YouTube and all sorts of stuff. But now that, now that, uh, now that, it's not like if housing affordability was much easier ever. I think everyone always felt the pain of it, but it just seems to be more of a common thing where people are talking about it because I've house hacked before too. Like I've rented out my basement. Uh, my mom, my, my, the first home my parents bought, my mom was, uh, was operating a, a, a um, not an Airbnb, but a bed and breakfast, right? Not legally, of course, <laughs> <laughs> but we had three mortgages. You do what you do to get by. Yeah. Right. It's just weird though. Like, again, I didn't think about it and, but yeah, it's, it's being talked about more house hacking. You know, honestly, I, I just heard that expression probably three weeks ago for the first time. <laughs> Someone mentioned it to me and I, what do you, what do you mean? Like the, the term itself almost sounds kind of has a negative meaning to it, you know? And I, I don't use the BRRRR one too. It's, I always say value add because that acronym just annoys the, annoys the heck out of me too. So I don't know where these, I don't know where these acronyms or words come from, but I right. guess everybody's using them. So, oh, this will annoy you further then. The, crypto, <laughs> the cryptocurrency, uh, 
when they're when they're making when they're making the noise of the money printing machine, they say brr as well. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> so so it has it has different the brr has, <clears throat> has different connotations for for different uh, for different groups of people. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, so Corey, what are you working on now these days? Just buying buildings? Are you buying with your own money? Are you buying with Michael Bugs money? <laughs> 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 You know, we're trying to, <clears throat> we're actually trying to make a decision here. I'm, I'm doing education. So I'm doing private coaching and multifamily as well. I have a, I have a six pillars of multifamily online course. I'm, I'm enrolling. It's coming up April 4th. I did a seven pillars course last year. Great success. You know, my students, most of them, a couple of them already have bought buildings. You know, almost all of them have made offers on buildings. So, I, I mean, I like education. I like giving back, but, um, I want to keep buying. I mean, I'm in, I'm in the business. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to, I make my living investing, not, not teaching T teaching is more my passion, but yeah, Mike and I just bought another building. He's, we're looking at different models. We're looking at private money right now because, you know, we're finding a lot of, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of cash sitting around and with rates as low as they are, you know, they're not afraid to lend at four or 5%. So we can sort of bypass any conventional bank and basically go and submit cash offers. So we've actually tried that a couple of times. We haven't landed a deal yet. So Mike is more the capital guy, you know, being a doctor, veterinarian, he's, he's got a lot of colleagues that have a lot of interest in this. Um, so I'm more of the deal facilitator. I'm more mm -hmm. of the acquisitions guy. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really good at finding the deals, but we're also looking at um, going larger, doing a, a, a limited partnership or even a REIT because I have a lot of existing assets you know, I have seven buildings right now. And we're looking at maybe spinning those, actually nine with his buildings. We're looking at spinning those into a REIT. You know, I know how that's how Boardwalk got started. So, you know, we're looking at different ways of doing, of scaling up, you know, the business that way. So we definitely want to keep working together. We want to keep buying apartments. We're just not sure of the actual uh, model that we're going to go with yet. Uh, question on the private, uh, private borrowing or private yeah. lending or whatever. Uh, what does four or 5% get? I'm, is that a second mortgage? Is that a third mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a first, you know, we're buying the whole thing. So it's basically secured as a first mortgage. Um, so this is kind of how we're doing it. This, the securing it is, is a little bit trickier. I know a lot of people use promissory notes, which, you know, that's doesn't, it's not really the same security as registering a mortgage on title. Um, I've done second mortgages on title when, you know, vendor takes with apartments. So, Mike has sort of been working with the people setting up the actual, how it's going to work. So it's either, it's either debt or equity. I've always usually just done, done equity on my joint ventures, like with my partners, because it's like, okay, hey, look, um, I'm not going to pay, make you guys payments, but you know, you have a percentage of the equity. So we end up, we find we end up giving a massive amount of equity. So, you know, if Mike and I can find a, you know, a decent deal with there's value add, we can borrow you know, in some cases, if we're buying at 80 a door, we can borrow up to 100% of the money privately and pay out that loan in a year to 18 months with new financing. Mm -hmm. So that's the model that we're looking at right now. And even the deal that we just, we just sort of loaded our own cash in on the Duke, we only paid 86 a door. We're almost done. We're in the refinance process now. We're probably going to land a refinance at 125 a door. So we're going to be able to pull all, our, all of our own equity out and redeploy it into another building. So it's That's the right. power of multifamily. It's one of the reasons uh, why I really enjoy doing this. So how do you manage this when you're, when you're at a market? Cause I don't think Mike's in the, uh, like he can't be in all those markets either. <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry, so cause, cause yeah. like let's take Leduc for example, mm -hmm. did you have existing investments there before? Yeah. So my, that's a great question with, with niche. Cause my niche, uh, my primary niche was always Edmonton. I moved to Edmonton in 2005. Um, Braden Equity is my property management team there who does everything from helping me to find buildings, doing walkthroughs. They're also owners, so they know exactly what the price per door is. They know exactly what the repairs are. They know what COVID pricing is for materials. They do all the renovations, just charge me a project management fee. So yeah, I, I really stick to that niche, Edmonton and area. We, you know, we, they do manage in Red Deer. And Saskatoon, we don't have, Mike and I have the same property manager in Saskatoon they're not nearly as strong as our Edmonton team. So that's the main reason why we're going there. So I still consider that my home market. It's new to Mike. So I've, I've got him embedded in there now. I've got him convinced this is, it's, a, it's like a, a four times larger sandbox than Saskatoon. 
there's a lot of multifamily players in Saskatoon and not very many buildings. So at Edmonton, the vacancy rates are higher. So there's more motivated sellers right now. So this mm -hmm. is just the location where we're finding the deals. Uh, I'm always hesitant to buy outside markets that I'm familiar with. Yeah. And when I mean I'm familiar with, I mean, my, my team is strong. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not just knowing the streets and whatnot. Like if your team isn't strong, you're going to be in a lot of trouble unless you're, uh, unless you're willing to be an active manager, which I'm not. Is that your experience? <laughs> Yeah, the people, the first thing they tell me with multifamily is, okay, I got all these listings. I got one in this town, one in this town. Should I make offers on them? And I say, well, what, are, what on earth are you going to do if you actually buy that building? How are you going to manage it? Who's going to yeah, manage yeah. it? Yeah. My first building was in like my hometown of Unity, 400 kilometers from where I was working. I just had a new baby and I just started a new full-time job. And it was a complete gut of a project. And I don't know what the hell I was thinking. <laughs> but I somehow managed to turn it around and make a profit. So uh, team, yeah, I would not invest anywhere where I didn't have a team. And, and another example, when I moved back to Saskatoon, because I had done very well in single family, I thought, well, if I know everything. I can go into Saskatoon, it's my home market. You know, everything's gonna be rosy. So I didn't do enough due diligence. I was starting a brand new team. I had a bad property manager, you know, even my inspectors, the renovation guys I had, I didn't know them. So it, it turned in, I ended up being active and hands-on, moving to a niche that I thought I knew very well. So <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Your, your team is everything. Yeah. And especially if you're trying to, you need a very good reason to move outside of where you're comfortable. Like you're saying, if I was gonna tell you, when I, I want you to invest in Edmonton or Cold Lake, Alberta, you're gonna be like, oh, well, I need a bloody good reason why I'm gonna do that, right? Well, I'd borrow someone's team versus- uh, yeah. Like I have some friends who went to, uh, they went to Sudbury okay, because uh, the fundamentals are booming now because they have, they have a, their major industry is nickel mining, nickel, yeah. <laughs> right? Which is what the price went through the roof. Yeah. So fundamentally they'll be, they'll be doing great, yeah. but if you don't have a team, so like literally like I have friends whose, whose contractor quotes have like doubled, right? Cause yeah. these are new teams for them, even though they have team, but that's, that's part of the. I find too many people are think, think everything in black and white, mm -hmm. right? It's either yes or no. Like my car has GPS in it. Yes. Check. Is it better than Google maps? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think I'm using? Right? <laughs> so I like, paid all this money for what? Now the same thing, just cause you, just cause you've got a team in Sudbury doesn't mean they're any good. <laughs> right? And it takes years to get that relationship. Like, it, it took me almost 10, I started working with Braden in 2010. It took me, you know, almost 10 years to realize how, how to fully utilize his services and the value that he could provide to me and yeah. giving me rental surveys, you know, for example, telling me what this price of this building, what these rents should be mm -hmm. versus believing what's on the realtor pro forma. Mm -hmm. I'm not slamming realtors. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the property manager knows the market, but you can't magically, you know, start a team or, or take over and expect results instantly. No, for sure. And then rinse and repeat rather than going to go try to create a new team in a different market. Yeah, you're better to find a, bu a building or a piece of real estate that's not as good in an area where your team is than to try to go somewhere else, for sure. This is what I call confirmation bias. We just agree on everything. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, I'm sure We're we just throw this on throw this interview in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can find something we disagree on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, what's your what's your outlook? What's your so you're investing heavily in Edmonton? Uh, what 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 is what drives the fundamentals these days? What's what's different? Is it still oil based? Is it? I, I hear tech jobs are moving in. Well, th yeah, that's it. Um, I think Alberta's finally got their act together and started diversifying away from oil. You know, tech is big in Calgary. Calgary market, I mean, the office space downtown is the towers are still 30% vacant, which is unheard of if you can imagine that, that every third building is sitting empty. Especially so, in a pandemic, who knows where that office space market's gonna go. Yeah, yeah, so I'm still in Alberta. I, I like Saskatchewan. I, I think Saskatchewan overall probably has a little bit more going for it just because of the potash and you know the world, you know, the world population and you know, having to feed the planet. You know, and Alberta is more centered on oil, but they are diversifying better. But I like those two markets because it's they're high growth. They're high growth markets. They're not the most desirable places to live. People don't go there because they go there where the jobs are. And 
you know, when I think of housing, you know, people tell me, oh, Cologne is never going to go down because it's a desirable place to live. Well, I put lifestyle as number three, the number third reason why people choose to live where they live. Number one is employment. Where can you go to have the best quality of life, which is the income? Second is family. You know, a lot of people, they're not going to pack up from Edmonton and move to Cologne and leave their, you know, their aunts and uncles and their parents behind in Edmonton. And you can't move everybody. So, you know, family is the second one and lifestyle is the, is the third. Sure. If you're retired or you, maybe you hate your family or, you know, you don't mind, you just want to get away then sure. But um, I think the outlook for BC, I think it's going to slow down here. We're not going to see 30% year over year. I don't think you're going to see a massive correction, no matter what happens to interest rates. I think it's going to pretty much stay the same or go up. I think, I think you're going to see about a 20% increase in residential in Alberta in the next year to 18 months. That's my prediction. And I think multifamily is going to go even higher, probably 30%. Crazy. Yeah. To, just to catch up to everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so if, is the diversification going to support Alberta long-term or is it also, what, what are the fundamentals of oil and how important is the oil in the future for Alberta's economy? Yeah. You know, I was just in Jasper on the weekend and I drove, drove basically from Jasper's Jasper. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I went there to get freedom because in BC we're still full restrictions here. Uh -huh. Pandemic in Alberta, there's nothing. So it was a nice vacation, uh, but just drive on that Canada. drive from there to Kelowna, we drove along the trans mountain pipeline. So you can see the amount of construction that's going on there. I, I mean, I don't think the world can transition off of oil right away. I think, especially what's going on right now at the situation with Russia, people are realizing that Canada has a safe, safe supply of, of energy. If we can find a way to get it to market, you know, I look at the oil sands because I worked in the oil sands. I worked in the oil industry. I drove a service truck. That's what I did while I was living in Edmonton. So I worked there. I went to basically every oil sand site. We're talking what a trillion dollars of investment up there. Now, if you put that in perspective, it's about the same as the entire Apollo space program or the entire interstate highway system of the United States. So that's the scale of the, of the size of investment up there. And as of a few years ago, a lot of those projects, they hadn't even started chugging out oil yet. You know, Sun, Suncor's, you know, they're their, new, their newest mine and some of these, a lot of them scale back. A lot of them sold out. So now we basically, you're down to three owners. You have, well, two, I think it's just Suncor and CNRL, which have basically kind of conglomerated on everything. But if that starts to produce at the potential that it can, it's, it's absolutely enormous. I mean, I don't, I don't think they're gonna revitalize Keystone. That's a very political issue in the States. But obviously, you know, you can hear Joe Biden now, they're talking about buying from Venezuela and Iraq, Iran and all these other countries, you know, instead of Canada. You know, the, he ripped up the contract for Keystone on his first day in office. So I don't think oil is going anywhere anytime soon. I think LNG is going to be big. LNG is going to start, you know, really growing in the next few years. I mean, LNG Canada off of BC is going to start going. They're going to start on the East Coast. I think it's going to be a good replacement, you know, energy. And I think nuclear too. I think you're going to see a lot more nuclear, especially now in Europe, trying to get off energy dependence from Russia, I think. And that's going to play well in Saskatchewan because they're the largest uranium suppliers in the world. Oh, so commodity-wise, I think Canada, we're still going to have that shovel economy. I think the oil industry is going to add to our pot, but we're not going to be as reliant on it before. I think Alberta has diversified enough. But I think in the next 10 to 20 years, I think oil is still going to play a, a very vital role in our economy. Yeah, it definitely doesn't change overnight. No. Especially if it gets cheaper, especially if between gas and... Um, internal combustion engine cars get cheaper. Yeah. Corey, sorry, you mentioned you drove service trucks in the oil sands and now you're a full-time apartment building investor. Yeah. So that's the, that's the path, huh? <laughs> well, I, I'm an instrumentation technician by trade. So I, I worked, I worked in uranium mining kind of from 1998 to 2004. I worked in, I worked at a gold mine overseas in central Asia. Uh, so, you know, I did a lot of shift work. And up until 2019, I actually worked in the diamond mines up north. So I worked in the diamond industry for eight years. But yeah, my, my time at Spartan Controls from 2007 to 2012 was interesting. The, the oil industry was very, very unique to work in. Uh, it was interesting, for sure. And then why the transition? To real estate? The, the, you worked in gold and uranium. Those industries paid well, don't they? <laughs> yeah, so... 
Yeah, I got away from gold. I mean, I was working a four week on, four week off shift in Central Asia. I was working, you know, 4,000 meters above sea level. So I developed, you know, health issues with altitude. So, you know, I was forced to leave that job. And then, you know, I just moved to Edmonton. So naturally I wanted to, you know, to be closer to home. So I took the, the job, you know, the service truck because I was home for the most part, I was home every night. I wasn't gone for weeks at a time, which was better on the family. Uh, so that's how I got into the oil industry. But I, all throughout, I used my same trade, my same ticket. I just got to work in a variety of different industries. So. And then what got you started into real estate? Yeah, I mean, I, the people I interviewed yesterday, it's funny. Yeah, how, how many of us read the dreaded purple book? You know, Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki, right? <laughs> how, how old were you? Oh, that was 2001. So I would have been 27, 28. Not sure when the book was written, but yeah. So I had already house hacked then. I bought my first up down duplex, well, single family with a suite in 2000. That was my first investment 22 years ago. And then I read the book and I started to get into multifamily passively because I was working overseas. I was live, actually moved to Central Asia. I moved to the Kyrgyz Republic. So I just started investing in other people's joint ventures in, in Edmonton. And that's how I got into multifamily. And then it just grew from there. Till I bought my first building in 2008, and then I bought another one in 2010, first JV in 2012, another JV in 2014, and then I think six buildings after that. And then just investors just became repeat investors and brought new ones in, and that's how it really started to grow. Can you share with the listener uh, what what's the size of your portfolio now? Doors or dollars, whatever you prefer. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess the total was 10 buildings over, so it was like basically 25 million. I think I raised something like. I raised something like 12 million from, from investors of, of private money. So six of those buildings that I didn't put any of my own cash in. So we still own six buildings, no, five buildings today. So we've, we've sold off, you know, about half of them as, as the joint ventures have come up, as we've reached our exit points. You know, I know a lot of these syndications, they don't have an end date. They don't have a divorce. They just keep, keep chugging along. But, you know, for me, it's important that there's a, a divorce because, you know, people's needs change. They want to, buy a house, get married, go on a trip, whatever. So, yeah, retire. you know, yeah. yeah, retire. So I think the exit strategy is very important. What's your, uh, can you give you, can you give some ideas on what their structures are for your joint venture partnerships? Yeah. So how about anymore? Well, for the um, beginner, because often beginners need to do the, need to offer equity to raise capital. Yeah. So what I did, I can say what I did and what I would do now, sure. if I was doing one-on-one -on -one deals, you know, keep it a simple corporation. A unanimous shareholders agreement, basically, a, you know, it's a 20 page document, you know, with all the clauses of what happens if a partner dies, you know, how, how do you sell your shares, you know, all these, all these kind of things. So um, you have that. And then you basically buy the buy the building, you have class A shares as, as the owner, and you have class C shares, which are non voting for the investors, and then you split the equity that way. So I didn't take any fees. You know, I felt that all the money had to be out there working hard and I would, I would take it at the end. I would, I would get paid on the back end for doing a good job. And, you know, I thought if I did a poor job, I would make nothing. If I did a good job, I would do very well and make a lot of money. So sorry, but, sorry. You, yep. you, you got paid nothing during the deal till the, de till the end? No, nope. no, none of my joint ventures. I was, I was working at the time I had a job and I just thought, you know, I, I looked at some of these syndications that, you know, they'll take a 3% acquisition fee. But then if you look at that on a, on a four, four levered investment, that's 12% of the funds raised. And the investment has to make 15% return just to get back to zero. So I thought, I'm not going to put us underwater immediately because you know, we already have to spend 50,000 to close on this. So that's, that's cash we have to make back too, just to get back to zero. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, in order to meet, you know, as I was saying to the investors, we can probably do 50 to 100% return in five years. That was my prediction. And I've been able to deliver that so far. And a big part of that was by, by not taking fees. But today I'm saying you need to at least take a 1% fee and take some kind of annual management because you have to get paid something because the amount of work to find a building, to buy a building, get it under contract, get a management set up is, is, is enormous, right? right. I'm sure you've probably lost some sleep along the year, <laughs> over the years as well. <laughs> I, I just told you about my 20% vacancy Saskatoon experience. And I was, and not only, not only I wasn't getting paid, I wasn't going back to my investors for cash calls. I was putting up my own money that I wasn't making any interest on. 
So I took it even a step further. So that, it was some, it was some stressful times. I'll tell you. <laughs> Your wife couldn't have been happy. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but we survived, man. So I always say, I make the joke and I'm semi-serious when I say, uh, you need a healthy little bit of ignorance going into real estate investing. Because yes. if you knew everything, you might not do it. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and you know what? Every Everyone, if you're in real estate long enough, it happens to everybody. You know, market's correct. Something bad happens. You have a deal that goes bad. One of your investor partners wants out. It's inevitable. It happens to everyone, no matter how much you prepare for it. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's part of, and to add to that, I think part of it is that you have to, you can't just bank on one property or bank on one tenant. Like you need lots of, you need a larger portfolio with some scale in order to absorb losses. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a good point. And one of the mistakes, well, not mistakes, but one of the strategies I have going forward is I'm going to get more singles in my portfolio right now. I don't have any because you can't just all of a sudden sell a multi if you need money. You know, if I owned a few townhouses, if I came out short, I could just sell off one of the townhouses, you know, to pay my bills. So that's important to diversify, not diversify too much. You want to keep your eggs in, you know, one basket, but not that many eggs, right? So you're gonna buy you're gonna buy single families for cash flow purposes. <laughs> <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I'll tell you. And looking at it in Edmonton right now, where I could buy a a, a condo, the dupe the the townhouse I'm sitting in right now is worth eight hundred thousand. I can buy the same townhouse in Calgary for two hundred thousand, and it ca it'll it will cash flow very well. So you can't or, build it for that. <laughs> I hear you. I just looked on MLS the other day and it's, you can buy a nice townhouse for 200. And, you know, I have a buddy, he just built a brand new single family house with a garage suite. So this is a new phenomenon in Edmonton. So you get the house, you get the detached garage, and then you have a suite on top of it. Uh -huh. So I think he's getting like something like 4,000 a month for rent on this thing. And the whole build, everything to build it was around 500,000. So very decent cash flow on a new build. So Just hang on, four thousand for the whole thing? Yeah, I think he's getting something like it's something like twenty five hundred for the house and then fifteen hundred for the garage suite. Got and it. I'm not sure if he's renting the garage space separately, but it's for the whole basically lot with everything, cool. right? But you can't find cash flow deals like that in Kelowna. You know, it's or it's it's very difficult. Yeah, from what you're telling me, Kelowna, it sounds a lot similar to the the, the Greater Toronto area. It's, yeah, it's tough. It's really tough to cash flow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Well, Corey, thank you so much for your time. And anything else you'd like to share? Are, are the recordings available for your conference? Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, for the listeners' benefit, Cor Cor like Corey mentioned, uh, by the time this comes out, this will be after after his summit. <laughs> There's definitely going to be recordings available, so I'll I'll make sure I have the link for you. It's just it's just the realestateoutlook.com is where you can go to find it. So the replays are going to be available. And yeah, so there's going to be a lot of good speakers. So anybody, if they want information or if they're curious about where the housing market is going, I've got, I've got um, 12 great speakers, 12 different, completely different perspectives on where the housing market is going to go in different strategies, you know, all the way from, you know, from rent to own. I got people doing new builds. I got pre-sale pre -sale construction. Some people are getting in on pre-sales because that's another way to get in, you know, Creative, you know, be creative is, is the, is the advice now, you know, it's, you're not just going to go to MLS and, you know, find a property. There's definitely different ways to go about it. I still believe hiring a realtor to, to represent your best interest is the best way to go when you're looking, but I mean, you have to be creative these days. You know, it's not the same market as it was. You have anyone, you have anyone bearish on, on the market among your um, speakers? Maybe you can find CMHC. Maybe, maybe you can go get uh, Evan Siddle, <laughs> yeah, former president of CMHC. <laughs> He'll tell you what's what. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. They're all pretty pretty bearish, actually. Um, Mike Mike is Mike is really bearish too, especially on Mike Bug on Saskatchewan, definitely. But I mean, Rachel Oliver, she does rent to own in Ontario, and she's very bullish on the market as well. You know, no nobody thinks we're going to see an outright crash. We're going to see things change just because we're expecting so many new Canadians to come in to, well, we need and they're to. all going to be looking for housing. Hmm? A million job vacancies. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That too. And, and rising a million and rising for the next 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so when people, 
Yeah. So in, even in your circles, when people complain about immigrants, like, you know, you know, when you pull up to the, you know, when you go to the hospital, they don't have enough staff. You don't think that's a problem? Where are we going to find these people? Right. So well, and the you, government needs to do more to recognize their, their foreign credentials, you know, like, yeah, that's crazy. my wife went through that. She, she actually got her, she came from the center of central Asia and she got her certifications recognized to, and then became employed with the Alberta government. But a lot for a lot of careers, if you're in the medical industry, for example, it's, it's very hard. You basically have to take your education, you know, all over again. So I think the government has to, to really step up and start recognizing foreign credentials. If they're going to fill these vacancies, I think that's a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like for, for example, like a 20 year nurse, I think we, yeah, we have to teach them your processes, but is stuff that different? Yeah. Right. And yeah. Good example. Like, maybe they could learn a little bit on the job. Maybe they could have some less sensitive jobs and then our Canadian nurses can have the more sensitive jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely huge shortages there. And it's not going to change until we have immigration and uh, yeah, you know, it's called the great resignation. I'm sure some people are sitting at, sitting at this out, sitting out the workforce. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the lack of immigration over the last, during the pandemic, I think is what really hurt us. And then hopefully that can catch up, calm down some of this inflation. The great resignation. <laughs> it's got a certain know, ring to it, term. doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds so <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the great reset. Scary. Oh, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do you, you guys want to talk about that at your summit? Sorry? Is there any talk about great summit, the Great Reset at your summit? No, no, we're just, it's basically, you know, how, how, we're, how we give people hope, you know, and, and I, I talk about people's the success they've had in the last two years, because a lot of people don't know other people's stories. So everyone has had a lot of success in real estate doing a, a variety of different things during the pandemic. So it's like, oh, yeah. okay, what, what have you done? And what would you suggest to someone just coming in now? What would work? either to get into the housing market or what would you invest in? So that's kind of what it's based on. Yeah. Anyone so. who just held a piece of real estate should have done pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> anything, yeah. anything had to be better than nothing. Yeah. I think the, yeah, that's great. I mean, I wish I would have done that here, but I mean, the advice going forward, I don't know if that's going to work at, at oh. least as well as it has, but who knows? Corey, have a great weekend. Thanks again for doing this. Yeah. Thanks Erwin. And I appreciate you having me on your show. Thanks again. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn how to invest in real estate from scratch, my team teaches uh, beginners how to use the number one investment strategy in a virtual free training class every month. Go to investortraining.ca slash podcast to register for our next class. I publish an episode here every week, so subscribe if you want to keep learning from seasoned investors like myself and my guests. Again, if you're ready to learn the nitty gritty about real estate investing, register for our next free virtual training class at investortraining.ca slash podcast. Again, thanks for listening to the show. Talk to you next week.